Hi, my name is Leandro Facchinetti, and in my previous video, not exactly the previous video, but two videos ago here on this channel, I was talking about a bridge between Reaper and OBS that allows you to record video in Reaper. That's not really true. It's recording in OBS, but it's seamless, the integration between the two pieces of software. And uh, people really liked that. Uh, people said that they are using, that it's working, and it's making them happy. In fact, since recording that video, I uh, added Windows support with the help of many people that tested the thing and confirmed that it was working and helped me debug the problems. In any case, it is working in Windows now, and I thought I would take the time to explain the code. So this is going to be a code review for how the OBS Reaper build uh, in the bridge, the integration between the two pieces of software works. It is probably the most complicated rescript I have ever written. And we are going to talk about this in two parts. In this video, I'm going to cover the Reaper part, the rescript. And then in another video, I'm going to cover the tool I developed that allows you to control OBS from the command line. And I'm going to explain why that was necessary. So this is going to be a long review in two parts. Let's jump right in. So this is the script that makes the thing work. It's actually three scripts in one. So you can see that I have here the three scripts, the toggle recording, stop recording, and start recording. If you have no idea what these are or how they work, you can watch the other video with the demonstration. This is going to be about the code that makes that uh, the, the, the three actions. And this is the same code for all the three actions as we're going to see. So it starts with some configuration, and this is something that we may change how the configuration is done. We may make that simpler in the near future. We have some ideas on how to make that work. But for now, this is just a configuration section, and I won't, I already explained in the other video what these configuration settings are. We will return here when we get to them, but I'm going to skip over to the more interesting parts to begin with. So all of these are pre preliminary things like getting information about the operating system and some auxiliary functions, and I have to declare all of these preamble in the beginning of the file because of the way Lua works. Ideally, I would like to have all of these things that are secondary at the bottom of a file, but in order to do that in Lua, I would need to make those variables global. And I don't like doing that, so I think it's a better design to have, even though it's not op optimal for reading, I think it's better to have these auxiliary functions first because I can then declare them as local and they will be visible below when they're necessary. So this is just getting information about the context and declaring some auxiliary functions. So I'm going to skip over that and we'll return when we get to where the functions are used. And then it will be clear why they are there. So let's start with this. This is super important. It is, uh, as I said, there are three scripts, but there is only one code base for all three scripts. So the way this works is something I already covered in some of the other code reviews, but I took that idea to the next level of this one. What's happening here is I'm looking at the name of the script. So you can see that the name of the file here is just uh, Leafac OBS, but when installed, it actually turns into Leafac OBS start recording, stop recording, or toggle recording. All these three actions have the same source, but the thing is they are looking at the name of the file in order to determine what they should do. So this is a trick that I, I play when I am installing this I am telling people to install this using Repack, and when you're installing extensions for Reaper using Repack, you can give the name of the extension, the version of the extension, and then you can declare the sources for the extension. And there are multiple files here. Oh, actually, we are looking at this one. So yeah, there are multiple fire files here. There are the scripts themselves. They are here on these lines. I'm going to turn off the word wrapping so you can see the lines more clearly. So you can see that there are three files here and they are the start and stop and toggle, but they all refer to the same source. So effectively what is happening here is when you're installing the scripts, you are renaming the scripts and the scripts are going to look at their names to determine what they should do. If they are a start recording or a stop recording, they are the same code. They're going to look at the source name to determine what they should do. And this renaming 
happens when installing. So that is how this part works. And this is going to be the start recording. And at this point, I think I should explain the high level idea, how the script works on a high level. What happens is when you run start recording or toggle recording, but you are not currently playing, so you should be starting the recording, this is what's going to happen. And otherwise, if you're stopping the recording, that is the part that is the most work really, that's the, what's going to happen, this other part here. So on a high level, what happens is you start recording in Reaper using this action, it's going to remember the point where you started the recording, and then it's going to tell OBS to start recording. The way that this command works is through the command line, and I built a tool, as I said, to control OBS from the command line. The full story is that in OBS, there is already this extension called OBS WebSocket, it allows you to control OBS from a WebSocket, which is like a web server, similar to the web server that you are requesting this video from. It's just a web server. But it talks in this uh, WebSockets way. It's a different protocol. It's a different way of talking to a server. But the problem is Reaper doesn't know how to speak that language. Reaper doesn't know how to talk to a, web a WebSocket. And I guess I could write a C or C++ extension that would do that for me, but it would be more complicated to write, to build, to distribute. Maybe I guess I could distribute it using Repack, but definitely it would be harder to code and to have contributors for. So I have people who are interested in contributing to this script. In particular, they are interested in making this configuration easier, but it's a lot easier to convince people to write some Lua than to convince people to write some C or C++. So I think it's still a win to have the Lua script talk to some other tool that then talks to, Re to OBS. So the way this is going to work is, this script is going to talk to another program I wrote that we are going to review in a future video. That program communicates using WebSockets with OBS and starts the recording. In fact, that, that OBS is running right now. If I take my face out of the way, you can see that OBS is recording. I'm recording using the script that I am reviewing. Isn't that meta? Super fun. Anyway, so that's how it works to start the recording. I just have to remember where I am in the Reaper timeline. And I have to do that because later when I stop the recording, I have to put the media item in that position. Then I tell OBS to start the recording. That's pretty much it. When you stop the recording, that's when most of the work happens. When you stop the recording, you are going to stop the recording in Reaper, you're going to stop the recording in OBS using the same protocol. You're going to talk to a, prog a program on the command line, which then talks to OBS to stop the recording. You are going to get that file and put it on the timeline. And there is one more wrinkle, and that is we want to record in OBS and we want the file that OBS produces to be in the directory of your Reaper project. So to begin with, when we start the recording, I, before I even start recording, I uh, query OBS, what is your current directory where you output your files? When you're recording in OBS, it puts the files in a certain folder. And I, I query that information, so I look, oh, you are currently, if you were to record right now, you would save this the file on this particular directory. Okay, so I remember that for later in Reaper, and then I tell OBS to change the configuration. So I change the configuration on the OBS installation so that it records on the current Reaper folder for your project. And then when I stop recording, I tell OBS to switch back to your original folder, to your original configuration. I don't want you to run this script and lose your settings in OBS. So I have to do this other thing as well here when I'm starting the recording. So first of all, how does this work? How do I determine whether I should start recording or stop recording? So should I run this part or that part? And could I have, that's an aside that's interesting thinking. Could I have two scripts instead? Because I'm sort of playing a game here of figuring out which part of the script should run. I could have two separate scripts. Yes, I could. 
but then I would either have to repeat all these auxiliary functions and configuration, or I would have to extract them to another file and then require it. It would be okay to do that. I decided to do it this way because then the whole search for a script is in one file. That's the file you have to install using Repack and you have to install it three times with three different names, but it's self-contained. There is no extra script that talks to this one in any way, no way to, no extra files that you have to manage, no, uh, no, no nothing that can go wrong really. As long as you have that one file with that particular name, it's going to do the right thing. So first of all, it's getting the action name and that's from one of the auxiliary things here in the preamble. The way this works is something we already covered in another video about another code review, I don't remember which one, but this Reaper action gets a lot of information about the context in which the action is running. One of the things it returns, the second thing it returns is the name of the script that it's currently running. So we get our name, we being the script, of course, we get our name here on this line. And then I do a string match, which is similar to regular expressions if you have heard of those, but if you haven't, this is just a way to grab a pattern on a string because literally the string is going to be liafac. Well, actually it's going to be a lot longer. It's going to be, in my case, slash users, slash liafac, slash library, slash, it's the full path to the script. But the part that matters is liafac underscore, that's the name of the script. And then a bunch of characters. It doesn't really matter which characters, just a bunch of them. And then a literal dot, Lua. And that is the end of the string. That's at the end of the string. So some of the characters here mean themselves. The pattern for L is the letter L. The letter E is the pattern for the letter E and so on. Same for underscore. But some characters have special meaning. The dollar sign means the end of the string. The dot means any character at all. So in this dot means any character at all. Plus means one or more of the previous thing. So if I am saying one any character at all, then this means one or more characters. And they don't even have to be the same. So yes, this would match Liafak AA, but it would also match Liafak AB. The characters represented by dot don't have to be the same. I'm not saying the same dot, the same character over and over. I'm saying any character at all, one or more times, different characters maybe. Then when I literally want a dot, because remember dot means anything at all. So if I literally want a dot, then I put a percent sign before it to escape so that now the dot means literally dot. If I don't have this over here, it would also work because dot happens to be any character at all. But it's more correct if you have it this way. And then parentheses mean this is the part that I care about because I'm actually matching the whole thing. I, I need to grab the name of this action. So I'm matching the surroundings of the name to anchor the part that I care about. But I don't want that. I don't want Lua at the end of the string. What I care about is just the name of the action, which is going to be something like OBS start recording. So I put parentheses around this to mean this is the part that I actually care about. Everything else is just for finding the part that I care about in the bigger string. So with that, I get the action name, which is going to be something like OBS start recording. And I'm going to use that action name in another case of match. By the way, I said that this is similar to regular expressions. If you are familiar with regular expressions, you should know that these are not regular expressions. They are similar to, they are called Lua patterns. There is a whole chapter about this in the Programming in Lua book, which is an excellent book, actually. It's short, it's concise, it's to the point, it's very well written, I think. I liked the book, I recommend it. But anyway, there is a whole chapter about Lua patterns in the book. They are like regular expressions, but they are simpler both in terms of usage, but mainly in terms of implementation, because a regular expression, expression engine that does everything you are used to in languages like JavaScript or Python, those regular expressions are super powerful, but they are also super complex to implement. An implementation of one of those 
uh, a regular expression matcher is the, the implementation of it is usually longer than the whole implementation of the Lua language, the whole language. So that's why they have Lua patterns, because they are simpler to implement. But they are they do everything that we need for this, uh, and they do everything we need for many cases, actually. So we are doing another one of those matches. This time we are matching on the action name, and we are looking for the word start. So if this is OBS start recording, it's going to match. And then we are also looking, alternatively, we may be running the toggle action, this one, because we may be toggling, but we have to check that this is a toggle and we are not currently playing because if we are playing and you hit toggle, then we should stop the recording. So let's look at this is playing variable. So here we have another one of the Reaper uh, functions that you can call. This one gets the play state, which is not only whether you are recording or not, but whether you're playing or not, whether you're paused, and this one in particular is just looking at whether we are playing or not. So this, all, all these things I said, whether you're recording, whether you are paused, all of these other things, they, the, the information about all this state is packed into one number. So this number is, it, it should be interpreted as a binary number and each bit in the binary number packs one piece of information. So if you look at the first bit, it means whether you are playing or not. And you look at the second bit, and it means whether you are paused or not, and so on and so forth. I am making up the meaning of the bits. You have to look up the documentation to find the exact ones. But in this one, what I'm doing is I'm projecting out the first bit. This, this means end one. So that is getting the first bit. And by first, I mean the least significant one. If you were to write this as a binary number, like this is a binary number, we are looking at this one on the right. And the way this works with the end is if we have an operation that looks like this, because effectively that's how you would write, you would write the number one. So this number is the result of get play state, for instance. So this may mean that we are currently playing and it's not paused and something else and something else. Each one of these zeros or ones represent one piece of information. And then we are doing the end operation with the number one. It's something called a bit mask. And the result will be if this second one is zero, it means false. False and anything else will be false. So all of these ones are guaranteed to be zeros. But this one is uh, one. So Anything and one is that anything. So if this is one, then this is one. But if that is zero, then both are zero. So that's how this operation works. It projects out a bit from a bit map. And then I check, is this the number one or the number zero? And then I have that, I that information, if this is currently playing or not. Now, if this is currently playing, then we get to actually do the action. The first thing we do is to call the command line to I developed to control OBS. And we are calling this as a command line thing. As I said, Reaper does not implement support for WebSockets. You cannot write a WebSocket here in a rescript. It doesn't support even a way for you to do HTTP. It does not support HTTP. You cannot do a web request from a rescript. One thing you can do is call a program from the command line. And on the command line, you can do all these things. You can talk to WebSockets, you can do an HTTP request, you can do whatever you want from a command on the command line. So it's one extra step, but you can do anything you could wish for as long as you take this extra step. And I abstracted the call to the command line using this OBS function that you can see implemented right here. We'll get to the implementation right now. Let's, let's look at how we are going to execute this program on the command line. Well, it's going to receive as argument the arguments you would like to pass to the program on the command line, and it's going to call this another one of these auxiliary functions called execute. And it's going to pass as arguments a bunch of things. So the execute program, uh, the execute 
auxiliary function takes the whole program you want to run. So these are just the arguments you want to pass to OBS. What we are going to do first is say that we want to run the OBS command line program. And then we are going to tag the arguments at the end. But there are some arguments that are fixed because they're part of the configuration. So one of them is the address, the other is the password, and then all the arguments you would like to pass. And the arguments here are things like, I want to get the recording folder to remember that for later. As I said, we need to restate, we need to get back to this original recording folder. And we want to start the recording and that sort of thing. So on this command line tool that I developed, you can pass a bunch of actions that you want to run in series. It's going to do all of those things for you in one go. So this execute is going to call OBS CLI, the, com the program that I developed, and it's going to pass the address, the password, and that's if you have installed OBS WebSockets in your OBS installation and you have set up a password, or if you are trying to run an OBS that is on another machine, which is something that is super advanced. I don't think that anyone would need that but it's something that is supported by OBS WebSockets because really it's just, as I said, a web protocol. So you can talk over the web, you can talk on your local network. You could, in theory, record on, on one machine and control OBS in another machine, and maybe if they have some sort of shared file system, this could, uh, this could work in that setting. I don't, think, I don't expect people to do that, but it was so easy to implement that here we are. And then we are also passing a custom error message because this execute function, if you pass it any error message, then it will show that error message uh, to the user. But if you don't pass any error message, it will show a default one. But this is just for the sake of the user. If they run the action and it fails, maybe because OBS is not open, maybe something else went wrong with their configuration, then they get a nicer error message, the, uh, an error mes message that looks like this. Now let's look at two things. Well, th actually four. Address and password are easy. They are coming from the configuration. So that's the part where the user of the script can come here and change the configuration. That's easy. Then we are also going to look at the OBS CLI. Where is it? I lost it. It's right here. So OBS CLI, that's the executable we are actually running. So we need to look at it. And then we need to look at the definition of execute itself. So OBS CLI is a path to the command that I want to run. I installed this command along with the scripts. So here are the Lua scripts in the repack installation or the settings for the repack installation. And here are the executables for different platforms, Mac, Linux, and Windows. And these are the addresses where you can find those executables. So I am going to install here in Repack, I'm going to install the executable, the command line auxiliary tool that I developed in your Reaper directory under data. That's what this part is saying. So this type data goes in your data directory in your Reaper installation. So I get the resource path, which is where your Reaper configuration lives. So you can come here to extension, uh, come here to options and show the Reaper resource path. And this is where all your effects, all your, I mean, JS effects, not DSTs or audio units, but all your effects, your rescripts, everything else is installed in here. And some of these were installed using Repack, including under the data directory, the executable. It's right there. It has been installed right there. And the, the Reaper function we just looked at, get resource path, is going to give us the path, how to get here. In my machine, that would be how to get to this place, to this directory. And then I, I tack on the name to find the actual script. But then I have to do th two things depending on your operating system. If you are on Windows, then I need to append a .exe because it's an executable on Windows, it has to have that extension. So when installing on Windows, I give an executable with .exe at the end. So that's the file name you're going to find if you're on Windows. I am not because 
I'm on Mac, so you can see it's it has no .exe. So we are doing that to adapt if you are installing this in Windows. But if you're installing this in Mac OS and in Linux, I also have to do something. As far as I can tell, when you're installing things with Repack, there is no way for you to set the mode of the file. And by mode, I mean the Unix mode. I cannot tell Repack to install something and make it executable on your machine. And if it doesn't have the right executable flag, the command is not going to work. Let me show you what I mean. I'll go to the terminal and I can show you all the direct uh, all the files in this directory, for instance. So I have a bunch of uh, files here and some of them are marked with different flags. These are metadata about your files and directories and this metadata includes a flag of whether you're able to execute that or not. And if that metadata is wrong, then the command just doesn't run. So that's what we are doing here. We are changing that flag because as I said, you cannot do that when you're installing the script, but you can do that when you, you just call this command and it does that for you. So the way I'm fixing this, uh, this feature that doesn't exist in Repack is every time you run this, I change that flag. And if the flag is already right, if you have run this command before, it will just do a no-op. It won't change anything. It will try to change the flag. Oh, it's already there. Okay, so schmod changes that flag. Plus X means make the flag executable. Plus means set the flag on. X means executable. And that's the path to the executable itself. So as you can see, in all platforms, you have to do some adaptations. In Windows, as far as I can tell, there is no idea of the flags to make things executable, they are just executable if, if they have this extension, I think. I don't know the details. I do know that this works because people have tried it and uh, they said that it worked without having to do this bit on Windows. All right, so moving on. Now we need to look at the execute function. How does that work? Well, it takes two arguments, the command you want to run and an optional message to show to the users if the command does not run right. And then it uses the Reaper facility for working with executables on the command line. This is the key. This is where we're actually going to run the command. And we are telling Reaper to the, run the command that we built in other places, for instance, here. And then we are also giving it a timeout. So Reaper is going to sit here on this line and wait until the command finishes running. In fact, it will freeze Reaper while the command is running. And this is super fast, so you probably won't be able to notice, but there is a lag. When you run with exact process, it is going to stop Reaper. Whatever you are doing in Reaper just freezes. It goes around the command and then comes back with an answer. It is usually very fast, but sometimes depending, maybe your machine is slow, maybe something else is going on, or maybe there is a bug on my executable and it never finishes running, whatever the reason may be, the command may fail. So I, I give it a timeout and if it waits for longer than 5,000 milliseconds, then it stops trying to execute the command. Reaper stops trying to, trying to execute the command and just finishes with nil. So output here in this case would be nil. Generally the output would be whatever is the output of the program. So if your program outputs some text, this is what is here. But sometimes it can be nil if, uh, first of all, there is a timeout, or maybe there is some other error, for instance, um, and this has happened before here when I was debugging, you give it a, a program that doesn't exist. So if instead of schmod you said doesn't exist, then the output would be nil. But generally, the output is a string. This string is, uh, on the first line, the number that represents the success state of running the command, and then the output of the command. And this status thing is something that exists on the command line. Anytime you run a program on the command line, it returns with a status. If the program ran successfully, that status is zero. If the command ran into an error, that status is greater than zero. And 
what we do here is we try to run the command. Sometimes it fails for catastrophic reasons, like it didn't find the program, it doesn't exist. Sometimes we run into a timeout, and that's a kind of error. But sometimes you run the command, it actually runs, and it runs into an error. Like, suppose you run the program, but you're not executing OBS at the moment. Then the command line program is going to try to talk to OBS, fail at doing so, and return an error that is a status of greater than one, uh, greater than zero. So next, right after executing the program, we check if the output is nil, or if the output does not start with a zero. So again, we are doing the matching thing with Lua patterns. If before we wanted the thing at the end, we used the dollar sign. If we want the thing at the beginning, we use a caret. Yeah, it's not intuitive at all. But the caret means the beginning of the string. Does the string begin with a zero? If so, this means success. The opposite of that is failure. So if, if it does not begin with a zero, it means that the output represents a program that failed to execute. And in that case, we are going to use a Lua facility. This is not Reaper, this is Lua. This is the error thing in Lua. It's a function that when you call, not only does it output the error to the user, but also it stops execution right there. The rest of the script is not going to run. And this is exactly what I want for my script. If you ever run into a, a problem running uh, executables on a command line, this is, I, I interpret that as a catastrophic failure. There is no recovery. I just stop the execution of the script. And depending on the Reaper, uh, depending on the Lua implementation, it's going to show that error differently. In Reaper, it shows up as a pop-up that the user can see. So this is something that comes with Lua. And I should mention here, there is another thing that comes with Lua. I think it's called OS Execute if I remember correctly, or it may be something similar to that. The difference between, I could have used that, right? Because it executes programs on the command line, but it's not the same as exact process. Because execute, as far as I can tell, only returns the status. It does not return the output of the program itself. And the script that we are going to run that talks to OBS and controls OBS, it actually returns stuff that we need. In particular, it returns things like what is your current uh, recording folder, right? So it returns data and we want that data. And that's why I use a, a Reaper exact process instead of OS execute that comes with Lua. So if there is an error, then I, I show the error message that the caller has passed, or if the caller did, did not pass anything, if the caller, for instance, in this case, I'm not passing anything to execute, it's going to just show the default error message is nothing at all. It's an empty error message. And or here means or, but the reason why I'm using it is if you did not pass any error message when calling this, for instance, in this case, then this error message is nil, which evaluates to false in an or situation. So false or empty string or really nil or empty string will get you empty string. So this is this or trick. Yes, sometimes it's useful when you're actually doing Boolean operations, but sometimes it's a nice hack to just give some parameter a default value, which is what we are doing here. And then I, I give some, this is string concatenation in Lua, some new lines. I say what the command is that you tried to run some more string concatenation, some more new lines. In fact, I learned that this way of writing new lines does not work on Windows. You have probably to say something like this. Doesn't matter. I mean, if you look at the error messages in Mac OS or Linux, they look nicely formatted. And if you look at them in Windows, they look just like a long line. It's fine. Then some more new lines, some more string concatenation, and then I say that the output was something. So if the output was nil, I have to convert that into a string because if you try to concatenate nil, this is string concatenation, and if you try to concatenate nil, uh, Lua blows up with an error 
And at this point, you are already running into an error anyway, but it doesn't give you the right error message. So to string makes sure to convert that nil into a string and shows you what the output of the program was. Maybe it was something like OBS is not running, which is something that the command line tool to control OBS tells you. But if everything went right, then this will not run. What we will run instead is this, that returns this shenanigans. Let's look at what this is doing. So it's taking the output, it's doing a global substitution on the output to get rid of the extra information we don't care about. So it's going to get rid of the zero in the beginning, because that was the status. We already looked at the status. We don't care about the status anymore. Whoever called execute, they're just interested in. If the program doesn't run right, then error. Output, you don't output anything because you just stop the execution. But if you get to execute the program and it works right, I don't care about the status. I already know that it's zero. So just get rid of the status for me. Just give me the juicy bits that are the output of the program. And then, then this part is going to do a global substitution of a pattern that looks for caret zero, that is beginning of line, uh, beginning of string zero. Percent sign s means space, any kind of space, a literal space, a tab, a new line, it doesn't really matter. All of them, I want spaces. Zero or more of them. Remember before I said that if you run exact process, I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to go into Reaper and we will try this out and I will show you what it looks like. So I can come here and edit this action and I can like, for instance, delete all the text from the action and just do the exact process. And I can do something like, um, what do I know that will fail? I, I think that this will do, I think this will work right and I'll give it a timeout of a thousand and I will print this. So Reaper show console message of that. And now we can actually see what Reaper is going to do with our command. It's going to return a zero new line and then whatever the command outputted. So this. And now since we are here, we can say don't exist and we'll see uh, an error message. That actually, this was not nil. So I guess maybe I was wrong. That was not nil. It was minus 999. Anyway, uh, the point here being, we want to get rid of that zero in the beginning. We want to get rid of every all spaces after your uh, output as well. So all the juicy bits. Oh, so I just saved the thing and it gave me an error message. So this is an example of something that happened. I am recording in OBS. I saved the script and, because this is literally the script I'm using to record this video. And what happened is it tried to run that command and failed with a status that was not zero. So it actually showed me the error message showing that the recording is already active. And the status in this case was one. And this was literally the command that it tried to run. Cool stuff. Okay, so... Uh, okay, I will close this right now. And come back here. Okay, so this... Uh, this string, yeah, that's what we're looking at. So it's going to take the output, it's going to take all the spaces from the beginning, including the new lines, and replace them globally. Yeah, that's the name of the function, global substitution. It repla replaces it with nothing. And then it does another replacement, so another G sub with the result of that. And that is at the end of the string, all the spaces, similar to this case right here, get rid of those as well. So we just trimmed the string to get all the spaces out, the status, it goes away as well. All that's left is the output of the program. That's how execute works. And with that, we covered most of the auxiliary functions. Oh, I think I, I skipped over one because we already looked at the definition of OBS CLI. Where is it? Yeah, right here. So we already looked at this and there is also this is window variable. This is easy. Reaper has a function to get you the operating system. I just do a match to see if you have windows. So it's similar to action name in the sense that we are just looking at a string that comes from Reaper and we are looking at a particular part of that string.
So we covered action name, we covered is Windows, we covered execute, we covered this part that is getting the command for OBS. We covered this and we covered that. So we are almost <laughs> at the end of all the auxiliary functions. There are only these parts left. Anyway, so here back to the thing that starts recording. We are calling OBS with this. This is the string that are all the arguments we want to pass to the OBS executable on the command line. So we want to do some actions and we can do all actions that Reaper can do over OBS WebSocket using this tool. There is a, doc a document in the description below. I'm going to link to the, the, the document uh, with all the commands that you can run. And we are interested in starting the recording. Yes, so that's one of them. The last thing we want to do here on this chain is to start the recording. But first, we want to get your current recording folder in OBS, set the current the recording folder to some particular place, and then actually actually start the recording. So the first, there are three actions. Get the current recording folder, set the recording folder, to the Reaper project and then start the recording. Now let's look at this part because this is interesting. This is what sh actually the problem with running this in Windows in the first place. So if we are running in Windows, we have to run a command in a certain way. And if we are in Mac OS or Linux, we have to run the command in some different way. The bulk of it is the same. We want to set the recording folder and we need to pass some JSON. That is just a way of, rep of representing the arguments to this action. And we need to pass what the recording folder should be in a particular JSON format. The problem is that JSON requires you to use quotes to represent strings. And we also need to put some spaces not, they are not really required, but they are better for readability. And also we need to include these brackets that could also have special meaning when you're running commands on the command line. So to escape all that, we put, uh, we, put uh, we put quotes, not parentheses, we put quotes around the whole argument. So the whole thing is interpreted as one argument on the command line. Let me show you what I mean in more detail. I'll go to a tool I developed to figure all this out because this gets complicated really fast. So I built this tool called echo command line parameters. Let me see if I have it installed already. Yes, I do. So I can just call echo command line parameters macOS. So when you're calling a command on the command line, this is a program that is just going to return whatever parameters you pass to it. It's not the thing that controls OBS. So we can investigate this. If you pass one parameter, then the output looks like just one parameter. Curious fact, fun fact, this is actually output in JSON. But if you pass multiple parameters, they are interpreted as multiple parameters. But what, what happens if you want a space in your parameter? Then you just put the thing in quotes and then it becomes one argument, one parameter, with a space. But what happens if you need a quote? Like maybe this is a sentence like, and she said, and then I need quotes here, right? And she said hello. Well, the problem is if I just run it this way, I lost the quotes. The way to preserve the quotes is to put some backslashes. And now the quotes are there. And these backslashes are here because this is also in a string in JSON. So as I said, both the command line and JSON require double quotes. They both insist on double quotes, actually. On the command line in macOS and in Linux, I can use single quotes instead. So instead of having to escape, I can do it like this. You can see that the quotes are preserved. That does not work in Windows. Single quotes don't escape in Windows. Moreover, the Reaper exact process thing we are using does not follow the same rules for quoting that the command line does. So this gets really complicated. 
And as far as I can tell, there is no way for you to do something that works in both Windows and Linux Mac OS at the same time. You have to check, am I in Windows or am I in Mac OS? If I am in Windows, then do this. If I am in Mac OS, then do that. You have to do different things. Let's look briefly at what's happening here with this and and or pattern. If you're familiar with other languages like C and JavaScript and Java and many others, there is this thing called the ternary operator. So it's going to check, is this Windows? If so, then return this, otherwise then return that. In Lua, there is no ternary operator, but we can use the Boolean functions like and and or. This is something we already did before. I was explaining how we are doing the default error message with or. Now we are taking this to the next level. We are also giving some, we, we are not interested in the Boolean is Windows. We are interested in this string if this is in Windows. So I'm using Windows and, which would return this. But if Windows is false, then false and anything would be false. So we actually get this string instead. If you're interested in learning more detail about this, it's covered in the Lua book and also in some other videos about Lua for beginners. It's Mm, it's something common in Lua to have this pattern of and or. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's look at the actual strings we are passing. I, sh I think I should mention this because I, I already went over other strings that are like that. They are all over the place like this, but if you have uh, this double square brackets, they delimit strings and these strings may include new lines they, like this. They may include quotes, so they are a perfect way for you to uh, represent in Lua strings that should contain quotes or single quotes or even backslashes, literally. They, it's not going to interpret the backslashes for you. So things like backslash in that I have used here, they don't have a special meaning when you're delimiting strings with square brackets. You can see that the syntax highlighting changes when you do that. They are not interpreted specially. Okay, I'm going to undo all the changes I made to this file right now. Okay, so now we want to look at the strings we are passing to OBS. So they, on Windows, as I said, they are delimited by uh, double quotes. That's the only way to make this work. The only way I could find to make this work in Reaper exact process, which, as I said, does not follow the same rules as the command line neither in macOS nor in Windows. And more interestingly, Reaper exact process is not consistent in macOS and in Linux. So macOS and Linux are different from Windows on the command line, and they are both different from exact process. And exact process itself is different in Windows and macOS Linux. Yes, if you want to get quotes right, it is a lot of work. Anyway, so you have to use double quotes in Windows, and you have to use single quotes in macOS and Linux, and you have to escape the double quotes with backslashes, but in macOS and Linux, because you are already using the single quotes, you don't escape the double quotes. And in the project folder itself in macOS and Linux, it's a folder, so it's using forward slashes to separate directories. In Windows, it's using backslashes, which would be interpreted specially by the command line, so I have to pass yet more backslashes to escape them. So I look at the project folder, and I do a global substitution of any backslash, I replace them with two backslashes. So now it's escaped the same way that these double quotes are escaped, then the backslashes would be escaped as well. And then all this command with all the three actions, get recording folder, set recording folder, and start recording, they are all passed to the command line. And if you just call it like that, then OBS CLI, the tool I developed, is going to just output all the outputs of all these three commands combined. But I'm not interested in all of them. I'm just interested, well, I'm just interested in the output of one of them. I do want to set the recording folder. I do want to start the recording, but I'm only interested in getting the output of the first command. So I do a field projection 
which is a utility I put into the OBS CLI program for the benefit of this script. But what you can do is just project, project a field out of the response. So as you saw before, when trying to run OBS CLI from the Reaper action that actually failed, yeah, I think I closed the error message for now, but yeah, I guess I can just rerun this. So you can see that the output here looks like this. It is JSON, and I can use that flag, to the field flag, to project some results out of this. So in this case, because it's an error, it only shows me an object JSON. But if you're running commands and they succeed, then you may have multiple outputs. So the first thing I do is to say, I want, I'm interested in the first of them, that I index by zero. So the first is the number zero. I'm interested in the first one, and I'm interested in the rack folder part of that. So here I have error, message ID, message ID and status. If you are able to succeed with a get recording folder, it will return a rack folder for you. Let me show that in action really since I are, I have OBS CLI installed here. It's not that hard to show. So I can do just package and OBS CLI in Mac OS and get recording folder. And it's going to output what the recording folder is. So I'm only interested in the first of these. So you can see it's a list now. I'm only interested in the first of these. So I can say field zero, that gives me the first. So now it's no longer a list, it's an object. And I'm only interested in the field that is rec folder. So I can say zero dot rec folder. It doesn't really matter if I write it like this or if I write it like that. It doesn't matter. Both give me the same answer. In this case, I wrote it like this. And then with all that, I have started the recording. I have set the recording folder to be the Reaper directory, not the Reaper directory in the sense of the configurations for Reaper that we looked at before, but the Reaper directory in which your project currently is right now where your media is right now. And I also, at the same time, got your original recording folder before I have changed it. And I do this all in one pass because each time you call a command on the command line, it is expensive. You have to spawn a new process, which is expensive. You have to connect to OBS via the OBS web sockets, which is also expensive just to run a command. So anytime you can bash these operations, you should do that. Oh, and I now need to explain one of the two remaining auxiliary things, the project folder. Where did that come from? Well, I look at the project folder using, that's the project folder. So it's the folder where your files live, where your media is right now. You can get that using this Reaper function and you have to pass a dummy string argument that is silly in Lua. It makes sense in other languages like C, where you would pass a pointer to our char, which would be our string, but it doesn't make any sense in Lua. But yet here we are. The Reaper API for Lua tries to follow the APIs for other languages. So you have to pass a dummy argument, but really we are interested in the output of this, which is the project folder as a string. I also, you have this extra option here. If you are interested, in having a recording. So this is a setting that people can tweak. If you're interested in recording, not on your current folder, project folder, but in a subfolder, you can do that. So that's why I concatenate this here. Usually it's just empty and that's what most people will have. But if you want a subfolder, that's how you do it. And remember that is where Lua or where Reaper is going to tell OBS to record them. That's where we're doing the recording. So you can set the subfolder. That's how this is implemented. Okay, now we can move on to the next line, which is to get the current position of the cursor in Reaper. Remember, we have already started recording in OBS. We have not started recording in Reaper. We have to do that in this order because starting the recording in OBS is expensive and slow. It has to go through the command line. It has to establish a WebSocket. Recording video is slower to start than recording audio. So we want to record OBS first and Reaper second. Because to start the recording in, in Reaper from within, a re, uh, from within a re script, 
is really fast. So if we restart recording OBS in OBS first and Reaper second, then all, every almost every time it's going to be almost perfect, perfectly in sync. The time it takes to go to OBS and back is okay. It takes a while. It's okay. Doesn't matter. After that, we start recording in Reaper. Then uh, both are in sync. If we do it the other way, you, you would start recording in Reaper. And then you would do the thing that is really slow, which is to establish the web socket and whatnot. So your recording would be way out of sync. I explored many ideas on how to make things sync better. I tried to look at the recording time in OBS because that's something you can do on the command line as well. You can, instead of getting the recording folder, you can get the recording status and you can get the current frame in which you are in the recording. I tried to look at that, but the problem is just by going and querying that to OBS, you introduce some lag in the request and response. So I couldn't find a better way to do this. So instead I just went with the simplest thing, which is just to just start the things in the right order. And most of the time they're in sync. Okay, so this is getting the current position of the recording in Reaper. And we have to do that before we start recording because we need to remember this for later. When we are stopping the recording, we need to get a video item in the Reaper timeline. So we need to know where to put it. How do we get the current position? Well, first we check if we are playing or not. Because if you are already recording in Reaper, you can run the start. So there are three OBS actions. Start, stop, and toggle. Toggle will look at the recording status and we, it will try to toggle based on that. So that won't work, but you can start recording in Reaper and then start the recording in OBS. And that will, that will work actually. Yeah, I think it will work and it will check. Is the current position, well, uh, for one thing I know for sure, I think that that case works, I have never tested it, but one thing I am for 100% uh, sure about, this auxiliary function will also be called over here when we are still playing. So I have to check, am I playing or not? Because there is no way for me to know the current position here in Reaper. I can only tell the, the position of the green bar and the yellow bar. So I have to check, am I currently playing? If I'm currently playing, then I, then I should look at the yellow bar. If I am not currently playing, there is no yellow bar. I need to look at the green one. The yellow bar is the play position. The green one is the cursor position. So then again, I use the and or trick and I say, am I playing? If so, get the yellow bar. If not, get the green bar. That's how this works. And then I finally tell Reaper to start recording. The name of this function is super counterintuitive for me. CSurf is for control surface. So this is a function that was supposed to be called if you are writing scripts to talk to those control surfaces like MIDI controllers. I guess not MIDI, right? Because if you have a MIDI controller, you could just assign to MIDI in Reaper. But there are control surfaces that are hardware that you can use to control Reaper from um, this specialized hardware. You're not using your keyboard, you're controlling with specialized hardware that is made with knobs and, and buttons for playing and stopping, dedicated buttons for playing and stopping. So you have this set of Reaper functions to write rescripts for those kinds of devices. But it, as it turns out, these functions are also useful for other things like what we're doing right now. So this is going to say, start recording. Why does it say on record? Well, I guess it is because when you press the record button on your control surface, it's just the Reaper way of saying, start the recording right now. And then there is another trick here. I said that I need to remember some things for later. I need to know the start position, the recording folder, actually just those two things. I need to know the start position to position the item when I'm done. I need to know the recording folder to reset because I set the recording folder before. So I need to remember this for later. The way I remember this for, for later is by 
writing to your uh, Reaper project file. I can write to the Reaper project file. When you save in Reaper, you get this as uh, this RPP file. From the rescript, I am able to write to that file. And that's what I'm doing right here. It's like a key value storage mechanism. So first of all, uh, there is this number. I don't remember what it's for. You have to look the documentation if you're interested in that. Then you have to give an identifier for your program or script. It is like a namespace. So I said that this is like a key value store and there is a namespace for your keys. So this is my script. I am saying that these are all the keys are under this namespace. This is the key. This is the value I want to store. This key value, uh, this key value storage can only work with strings, but start position is a number, so I convert that to a string. Original recording folder is already a string, so I just store it there. That's it. That's how you start recording. We already looked at all the auxiliary functions, we covered them all, and we looked at how to start the recording, either from the start script or the toggle script. Now, we need to learn what happens when you stop recording, either with the stop script or with toggle if you were playing before. So it means now you want to stop the recording. The, basically, what we are going to do here is talk to OBS to stop the recording, stop the recording in Reaper, get the file that was recorded, put that in the timeline, reset your recording folder to the original recording folder, and call it a day. That's what we do here. But it's a, a, a long piece of code. Most of it is... It's okay, it's not that bad. First thing we need to do is we need to get back those values we saved on the Reaper file. We need to remember that the, the start position and the original recording folder, we just stored that in the, the key value storage. Now we need to get those values back. So the way we do that is to read from the Reaper project file under the correct keys, under the correct namespace, and seal that mysterious flag that I don't remember but this is going to return two things. The first is the value itself, but also it's going to return whether there was a value there at all. You may be looking under a key that doesn't have a value. That may happen, for instance, if you have just, uh, you didn't start a recording in Reaper, but you stopped the recording. So when you just, you did not start a recording in OBS, but then you just run this action, which I'm not going to run right now. Because as I said, I'm recording the video using this script. But if you do that, and, and of course, if I just I, I hit stop recording now, it would work because I, I, I am recording. But if you are not recording and you hit this, then head start position in this other one for head original recording, it would return zero. So if these things are zero, then I just stop the execution of the script with an error message. I'm doing this in a different way. I am not inside any function definition right now. So I can say just literally return. And if you say return in Lua and you're not inside a function, you stop the execution of the script. So in some ways it's similar to the error thing we looked at before. Where is it? It's in the definition of execute. So we looked at the definition of execute and we saw this error thing. It's similar in spirit, what I'm doing here, but Error is catastrophic. It, it means I couldn't connect. I couldn't run a command. Um, something really bad happened. And it even works from within function definitions. It just stop it as stops execution, whatever the execution is at the point. But I don't need that drastic measure here because I'm on the top level. I'm not inside any function definition. I can just re return. It will stop the execution of the script. You can think of the whole script as if it was a big function body that was called when you're running the, re, uh, the Lua script. In fact, that's pretty much how Lua thinks about your Lua scripts. You can read about that in the programming in Lua book. Anyway, Reaper has this function called a message box. Uh, yeah, message box, MB for short. It, it looks nicer than the error one. 
So that's why I'm using this one over here because I can. If I am inside a function definition, I cannot afford to do this because return would not uh, stop the execution of the script. It would only stop the execution of that function. But in this case, it is on the top level. So message box looks better than the other message box with the error we looked at. Then I give some nice error message. Zero means I want to have an OK button for the person to click. If you pass other numbers, you can look this up in the documentation. By the way, I keep saying that, but if you're not familiar, you can come here in Reaper and go to the Rescripts documentation. You can also Google for a better looking one, same material, but better formatted by XRyan. You can just Google Reaper documentation or Rescript documentation, you'll find that. So different values here give you different buttons. There will only be an OK button, but you can also have yes or no, or retry and, and so on. So that's a way to prevent you from trying to run the stop script when you have not started the script before. You have not started recording in OBS before. And then I need the start position as a number. That number represents where you are on the timeline. So I convert that string into a number. It's the dual of what we did right here. Next, we get again the current position. This time we are very much playing. So we are getting the play position, the yellow cursor on the Reaper timeline. That's the stop position. That's where we stopped recording. I need to remember that because we are going to put a media item in the timeline I need to know where it started that was recorded before. I also need to know where it stopped. And I need to do that before I stop recording. Same control surface, same story. These lines look very similar. They are very similar. Now, we are going to do something similar. You can see that the start and stop are like two sides of the same coin. So that part here we'll do something similar to this part over here. Here we started the recording, we set the recording folder to be the Reaper project, we got the original recording folder to restore it later. Well, now is later. We are going to stop the recording, we are going to set the recording folder to the original recording folder, doing all the shenanigans necessary for escaping quotes in Windows with checking if we are in Windows, escaping with backslashes, doing the replacement of slashes with double slashes, with the replacement of backslashes with double backslashes, all of that. In retrospect, if I knew that coding and escaping would be this hard, I would probably have designed OBS CLI to not need quotes in the parameters, but that was already there. And when I learned that Windows was different, it was easier to just patch here. <laughs> Maybe someday I could change the OBS CLI tool so it doesn't need this and it doesn't need uh, quotes. But as you'll see in the code review for OBS CLI, it was a lot easier to implement things if you just pass JSON on the command line. Anyway, that's how I implemented it. And you also stop the recording. And I don't need any information from this, so I don't project any fields. I don't assign it to any variable. I just, I'm just interested in making the actions happen. Now, I need to do something super important. When you stop a recording in OBS, it doesn't stop immediately. And that's because it has to do some sort of writing to the system. It needs to write the rest of the file to the system. It needs to clean buffers. I don't know what's happening there, but I know that if you stop recording in OBS, it takes a, a tiny amount of time for that to actually happen. Well, the problem is, if you don't wait for that time and you try to put the media item in the Reaper timeline, Reaper won't be able to process that file correctly. That file is effectively a corrupt file for that small period. Isn't that interesting? It's a super subtle thing. For that small period when OBS is stopping the recording, you have to wait. You don't put that file in the timeline. Not yet, you have to wait. So what I do here is I get the current time and I do something called a busy wait, okay? 
It's a, a terrible technique for waiting, but I couldn't find anything better. So I'm going to do a busy wait. I am going to check. Did I stop recording already? Because this, there is this action in OBS, in OBS WebSockets, get streaming status. We are not streaming, we are recording, but it's the same action for both. So this get streaming status is going to tell us whether we are streaming, but also whether we are recording. And that's the field that I project. So if the get streaming status is false, then I am sure that I have stopped recording. Otherwise, it is true. I am still recording. I'm still in that period between having told OBS to stop recording and OBS actually stopping the recording. So what I do is just a while loop. And I'm going to do that again and again and again. But I don't want this while loop to get stuck. Because if things go wrong, I don't know exactly how things could go, could go wrong in this situation. Because if you tried to stop a recording and you got to this line, it means that Reaper was uh, OBS was okay with stopping the recording. Otherwise, you would have an error and this line would stop the execution of the whole program. Actually, that whole chain we saw, OBS, the function, will call execute, the function, which would call error, the function, which would stop execution. So if stop recording succeeded, almost definitely you will get a streaming status of false in the next second, two seconds, I don't know. But if that doesn't happen, I don't want you to be in a loop forever. I don't want Reaper to get stuck as well, right? So what I do is I go to OBS and I ask, did you stop recording already? Okay, and so on, and do that in a loop. But if I did that for too long, then I timed out. And that's why I, I'm using this time precise, which gives me the time, I think, in milliseconds, seconds, I don't remember. But then there is this timeout, which the user can configure. Yeah, so it's in seconds. This timeout is wait for 10 seconds at most. This is generous. I expect people to have to wait for half a second. They don't even notice. In fact, the time it takes for this OBS function to run, to actually spawn a command line, make a uh, WebSocket connection, that is probably longer than the time it takes for OBS to stop recording. But if you don't have this in place, then Reaper will put a media item in the timeline, but will not the media item will not be right. You would have to close the project and reopen it for the uh, media item to be correct. And I know that it would be incorrect because I don't think it would show in the preview for the video in Reaper. I am pretty sure that it will not show the the wave of the the, the, the audio along with the video. So it would not show the wave forms in the timeline. So that's why this is here. So I'm checking if the timeline, uh, if the timeout has elapsed. And if so, I do the same tri trick I did before to show an error. So it's the same trick we did here to show an error. So return to stop ex execution, So uh, show a message box. I really don't believe that anyone will ever see this error message. There you go. Next, there is a fix me here because this is a hack. I need to get the recording. I need to get the file. At this point, I am sure that OBS has stopped recording because I told it to stop recording and I have checked that it has stopped recording already. So we have a file. All we have to do is put it on a timeline. The problem is, what is the file name? Ideally, OBS WebSocket would be able to tell me that. And it will on the next release of OBS WebSocket. In fact, it has already been implemented, but it has not been released yet. In the, current, in the currently released version of, of OBS WebSocket, I can get the recording folder, I can set the recording folder, but I cannot query for the file name that is being recorded. To do that, well, to work around that for now, for the time being, while the next release isn't out yet, I don't know when it will be. The previous release, I think, was... Half a, uh, half a year ago, so they don't release often. I have to work around this. The workaround has stood the test of many people using it, but it's a huge hack. I know what the recording folder is. It's the Reaper recording folder. I set the recording folder in the start script, right? 
All I have to do is look for the file name. So I know that by default, OBS records to MKV. Most people don't change that setting. Some do. They complained that the script wasn't working. You should, if you're not, be recording in MKV. If you're recording in MP4 or .mov and OBS crashes, you lose all the recording. But if you're recording in MKV, then you will only lose the recording after the crash. It is more st uh, MKV is more stable to crashes. And it's very easy in OBS to switch from MKV to uh, MP4 in a file you have already recorded. So if you need an MP4 for whatever reason, you can go into OBS and remix the file. So MKV, that's the default. That's the best format. So it's a good default. So what I'm going to do is, I know what the folder is, and Reaper can list files in a folder. So I'll list the files in the folder, look for files that end in MKV, and take the last one. Because by default, some people change this setting, but I don't think that many people do. If you have a default setting in OBS, it gives you file names that are based on the current time, the current date and time on your machine. So if I just sort the MKVs on your directory and get the last one, it will be the most current, the, the most recent recording. That has some problems. But if you have other MKV files in your project and they sort later than your recording, that's going to break the script. But if you change the file extension, then you also have to change that in the settings in this script. It's not MKV, for instance. You have to change that in the settings for this script. But if you change the format for the file names in Reaper, you will have to... Uh, this will not work, actually, uh, because your new format may not sort so that the last one is the one you want. Anyway, it's a hack. It will go away, hopefully. Anyway, so the hack works by getting a list of files, and you can list... Uh, so this is going to be a list in Lua. We are going to traverse a directory, and there is this Reaper enumerate files function to enumerate files. I could have gone to the command line and do something like execute ls, so it would be bin ls. We just did that actually in one of the examples in this video. And it would give me the whole list. And then I could even do something like sort. I guess ls already returns things sorted. I could get the last one. I could do something like this. I think that would work, but it would not be cross-platform. I would probably have to say something like, is Windows? If so, then I think it's dir, and I don't even know how to do tail in Windows. Or then this. I don't like that. I guess it would have to be bin tail. Since Reaper has a function to list the files in a directory, I think it's smarter to just use that. I'm doing a loop here. File index is going to go from zero to infinity. That's a Lua constant that holds infinity. I need the file index when enumerating the files. I need to give the project folder, which I got before. It's in the preamble. We went over that. Then I get the file. The file may be nil if I have finished enumerating. In that case, I break. So yeah, that's a this math huge and break. It's a convoluted way of looping over all the file names in the in the folder. And that's because that's the API that Reaper gives me to enumerate files. I have to pass the number that is the index for the file in the folder, and it returns nil if that file is not there. Strange way of listing files. That's how Reaper works. And then I do another one of those matches to get the extension. That's MKV by default. So I'll get the file. This is a literal dot. This is the extension. This is the end of the string. So I'm matching .mkv, for instance. And if I match, and only if I match, I insert the file into the table of files. By the end of this, I will have a table called files with all the files. They will not necessarily be in order, because this function, as far as I can tell, gives me the files in any order it wants. But, but this time I have already filtered for mkv. Oh, yeah, so I guess before I was saying I could do execute something like ls tail 
Actually, it would have to be LS. Well, I guess at this point I need to use double quotes. Yeah, that's annoying. So what I would have to do is do something like this. I only want to list MKVs. And that's what this part is doing. It's only listing MKVs. At this point, I have a list of files that are all MKVs. There may be multiple files in your folder. What if you are recording many takes? You're starting and stopping the recording many times. Well, first of all, if you don't have any files in that list, then something catastrophic happened. I could not find the recording. Do you have the right extension configured? Something else happened. I don't know. Return bailout. Otherwise, sort the table of files. As I said, Reaper is going to give me those files in any order. Sort in the, the list of files. And then get the file that is at the length of the list of files. In Lua, tables or lists are uh, indexed by one. So this operator gives me the length of the list. So if the list has two elements, I have two files.mkv in the folder. And then I have two files in my files list. And this operator gives me the number two. Two elements in this list. And also two is the index for the last one. And I have already sorted it. So it's the most recent one. Excellent. And with that, so this whole section was just to work around the fact that I cannot get the file name from OBS itself. And also to work around the fact that Reaper has a weird API for listing files in a directory. But now I'm ready to put that media file in the Reaper timeline. So we are almost at the finish line here. We have to do th two things. We have to figure out where, in which track, you may have multiple tracks. In which track do you want to input to, to, to put your video? You may have multiple tracks. Which one is your video track? And then let's put the media item in place. And just for good measure, let's delete the... So I guess I can already cover this part. So just uh, remember before I said there is this key value thing. If you set the, the key value thing that is in your RPP file, you are writing to the project file. If you just write the empty string that amounts to erasing the contents of that position. So this only accepts strings. The empty string has a special meaning. It means delete that entry from the key value store. So these, value, the, these two lines are already covered. They're just cleaning up the thing we set over here. Why do I clean this up last? Well, I could, I guess, clean it up right after having used it, which is right here. So I could clean it up here. But the thing is, if something goes wrong in the middle, then that information is still in your Reaper project. And depending on what went wrong, in theory, you could just rerun the action. Probably no one is ever going to run into an error that they can fix themselves and I can actually use these values over here. That is just for good measure, but the, the information will be there. In most cases, what happens if, is if something went wrong, then you're never going to lose the recording. OBS was recording, so that's fine. But you may lose the ability to put the recording automatically on the timeline in Reaper. So that's fine. You just drag and drop the file into the Reaper timeline, as you usually did before running this script. You sync it by hand, and off you go. Anyway, the file is only the, the information on the file is only erased if everything went right. The information is always in your Reaper project file. Now, two blocks of code. Find the right track in which to input the media item and input the media item. Now, the, the policy for finding the right track on a high level is if you have a track named OBS or whatever you set this variable to. By default, it's OBS. If you have a track named OBS, use that one. That is your OBS track. If you have no tracks named OBS, create a track, call it OBS to be used next time, and put the, the recording there. Also, there is this other option, this 
extra this this advanced setting that you can use to always create a new track that may make sense if you're doing one of those video uh, video songs in which you are recording yourself and you just do a grid of recordings of yourself then you are overdubbing the recordings it doesn't make sense for the kind of video i'm doing right now which is a tutorial but it may make sense in more um, a more musical setting so you just always create new tracks and then of course your timeline will be huge with all your recordings overdubs videos but it's something you can do so that's the policy look for a track named obs if it doesn't exist create one and alternatively you can also always create a new track okay let's see how this works we create a variable called obs track and then we're going to loop over all the tracks because we're looking for a track named obs of course Reaper doesn't give you a way to just list all the tracks you have to jump through some hole, uh, hoops because that's what the Reaper rescript api is it is it's weird it's fun so i get the number of tracks that's something i can do i can take the index this time the index is zero based Things in Lua are one-based. Some things in Reaper are one-based. Some things in Reaper are zero-based. The number of tracks uh, to get track, yeah, to get a track that is zero-based. So I go from zero up to the number of tracks minus one. And I tell it to go in steps of one. Why do I do that? That's already the default. Well, when doing loops in Lua, the default is to go up by one if this number is lower than this one. But if this number is lower than this one, Lua will go down. So if you say track index five comma one, then it's gonna know that it needs to go from five to one downwards. And if the number of tracks is zero, you have no tracks in your project. You just have a project that looks like this, you start the recording. Then in that case, the number of tracks is zero, and you would get minus one. So Lua would go from track zero to track minus one and everything would blow up. But because I am now explicit that I only ever want to go up, uh, Lua will not try to go from zero to minus one. You have to tell that they step to be explicit because this may be negative. Now I get a track I'm using the Reaper function to get a track from the current project. I don't know what this zero is about. It's to get from the currently open project. The track index is over here, zero based, get the track, get the track name. The track name will return something that I don't care about and the track name. If the track name is equal to the track name set by the user right here, then the track name is OBS. In that case, I tell that the track name is uh, OBS track is the current track and I break out of this loop. By the end of the loop, either I will have a track here or I will have to create one. So if I don't have a track there, it means I have to create one. But also I have that setting. If you always want to create a new track, then I also create a new track over here. So this block is going to create a, create a new track. How do we create a new track? Well, we insert a new track at index and the index is the number of tracks that makes the new track to be the last track because it's going to go on the number of tracks, the last one. Then I get that track, that is my track, and I set the name of the track. So this is a function that sets and uh, gets mm, all the information about the track that is a string. So it can be the name, it can be... I don't even remember the rest, but there are many settings about the track that are strings, and you can set them over here uh, you can set them using different magic names over here look at the documentation if you're in look at the documentation if you're interested in learning more about this but yeah so i'm getting the obs track that i just created and i'm setting its name to be the track name and i have to say true because this is the same function to get into set when i say true i mean set when i say false i mean get because of course okay so at this point, I have in the variable OBS track, either because I found it 
or because I am always creating a new one, or because I didn't find it and I had to create a new one, it doesn't matter. At this point in the script, I know that OBS track is the track in which I want to add the media item. So I'm going to go ahead and add a media item to the track. And it is super important that I have waited for OBS to finish the recording. I never want to run this line on, not actually this line, but this one over here, but I never want to run this block when the file is not finished recording yet, because that's when problems creep in. So I'm adding a new media item to the track. Then the same way I could set uh, media track information, like the name, I can set media item information. So I can set the position and length. The position is, so if I have a track right here, where is the media item? That's the position, it, where it starts. Length, how long is it? Well, I know I need to start at the start position. I remember that when I started the recording, so that's where I put the media item and the length needs to be the stop minus the start. Right, that's your length. That's from here minus to here. Okay, now I need to associate this media item. Currently, it's an empty media item. It doesn't have any media associated with the item. Now I need to associate the media with the item. Well, actually, the association doesn't go between uh, media and item. The relationship is tracks have multiple media items. Media items may have multiple takes, and a take is associated with a media, a piece of media. So I have to do all those steps. I take the media item I have created in the track and add a take to the media item. I get a take. And then I associate a piece of media to that trait, to that take. So I'm going to come up with a piece of media. This is a PCM source. So PCM is for pulse code modulation, which is it is how you represent things like wave files for sound. It is a pulse. The, the sound is a pulse. You are encoding it. And modulation is just how it's transmitted in the air by radio waves. It's a name that has stuck. So wave files are PCM files. And the, the fact that we have support for video in Reaper is somewhat new. It's, I guess, since version five. So the same function that you use to add an audio is also the function that you use to work with video. And the function has that name that actually has to do with audio. Then source, and then create from file. So we are creating a new source for a take that belongs to an item, that belongs to a track, that belongs to a project. And we are creating that from a file. It's in the project folder. It's the file we have collected way up there in that huge hack. The project folder we also got from way up there. It's in the preamble. We talked about this hours ago. So that's the source. And then I finally associate the take with the source. That's the final link. The stake is associated with this video. We got this. Now, there is something that most people will never have to do, but if you find that in your configuration, the, Reaper, the, the OBS recording is always off by the same amount, maybe it's because your machine is too slow to start the recording, maybe something else is happening, whatever the case may be, maybe you're recording on a different machine over the web. If that happens and you realize that it's a problem, then I give you the opportunity to, with a setting over here, latency setting, you can just offset the recording by a fixed amount every time you record. So you can measure, oh, maybe in your setting, OBS is always off by 200 milliseconds. Give it a latency, I think it's in seconds. So you give it a latency of 0.2, it will offset the take 
You can give negative latencies if you need to offset to a different direction. You can go left and right. It's equivalent to having some audio and just slipping it. Maybe I can do this. Uh, let's see, if I have a recording, I am recording right now, so I can just start recording right here, and then I stop. And then you can see that now this actually has two takes, so it's a media item that has two takes. Kind of cool, because I was talking about takes just now. And I can slide, I can slide the media under the take. That's something I can do here in the interface. The media item stays in place, the take stays in place, but the contents, they move around, they offset. So I already set the media item position to be in the start and stop positions of your OBS, uh, of your Reaper recording, right? So it's already in the right place. Maybe I just need to offset it inside a little bit. By default, latency is zero, so it doesn't offset at all. Finally, after having inserted a media item, you have to build the peaks. That's the name for this graphic that shows the waveform that is called the peaks. And I have to rebuild. I, I build any missing peaks here. That's just me calling a Reaper action that is available here on the actions menu. So I can say build missing peaks. It's right there. I got the command ID from there and I'm running this. So this is equivalent to coming here and clicking on this and running this action. If I don't do this, then the video will be put in the timeline. It will show up in the video processor or, or on the video preview. You will be able to hear the audio from the video, but you will not see the waveform. So that's why this line is right here. Thanks for watching this. This has been a long ride. It is a complicated script, probably the most complicated re-scripts I have ever written. It's also a lot of fun. It was a lot of work to get this to work. It was a lot of work to get Windows to behave with the escapes. Not because Windows is bad, just because I'm not familiar with it. Anyway, I hope you learned about Lua, about Reaper, about Rescripts, about OBS, about the command line, about all these things. Make sure you subscribe if you're interested in these kinds of deep dives into code bases. Because there is another video coming about the OBS CLI part of things. I assure you, it's a lot simpler on that side. That tool is very simple. But uh, yeah, so subscribe to the channel. Make sure you watch the other videos in this channel. They are all about code and, and Reaper and fun stuff. I do have, if you are interested, uh, I do have ways for you to support the channel in uh, Patreon for recurring support, in PayPal for a one-time thing. It's up to you, do whatever you want. If you want to support this and you're having value out of this, then throw some dollars at me or euros. I would love that. Anyway, thanks for watching. I see you on the next one. Bye.